does something about this feel wrong? The answer is probably yes, but you likely can't explain why. Why do entities that are almost human creep us out more than things that aren't human at all? How's it going everybody? Welcome back. My name is Chase. Today we're going to be exploring the uncanny. Not just the uncanny valley and why humanoid robots or realistic looking dolls make us feel creeped out, but I want to go a step farther and explore the uncanny as a whole, and instances in life where that same feeling may be invoked. Let's get right into it. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy. I don't want to waste time explaining what the uncanny valley is because I feel like most of you guys probably already know by now. It's not exactly a niche thing, it's talked about all the time now online. If you're watching this video, I assume you probably already know what it is. But for anyone who's completely in the dark, the term Uncanny Valley was first used by Japanese roboticist Masahiro Mori. Mori spent the 1960s working on machines that were designed to mimic human movement and appearance. He noticed a trend of people generally responding more positively to robots that were more human-like. But this was only up until a certain point. Eventually, the robots reach a stage where they become too human-like while still having characteristics that clearly identify them as being not human. At this point, people begin to react with extreme discomfort and are very avoidant. Mori took note of his observations in an essay written in the 1970s, and the term the uncanny valley was coined. Later in the video, we're going to get into a few theories about why entities that closely resemble us make us feel this way, but before we do that, I want to try to define what the uncanny actually is. One of the first people to really explore the concept of the uncanny was the founding father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. In Freud's 1919 work, Das Unheimlich, or in English, The Uncanny, Freud describes the uncanny as the class of terrifying which leads back to something long known to us, once very familiar. Which is to say that the uncanny is something that feels familiar and alien at the same time. Something that should feel ordinary or mundane feels off-putting. You see, Freud believed that much of human behavior was driven by repressed desires, fears, and memories. These pieces of you are often buried deep within your subconscious mind. When the uncanny arises, it is this repressed content being driven to the surface. So beliefs that you're more likely to hold as a child when you don't really understand the way the world works yet, like believing in magic, or spirits possessing objects, and your toys being able to move by themselves. When something in the world provokes these old repressed beliefs, the result is that strange, unsettling feeling. The uncanny. To Freud, things like hyper-realistic dolls and machines are uncanny because they blur the line between the animate and inanimate. Our expectations of what it means to be alive, conscious, and human are being challenged. Another different interpretation of the uncanny comes from French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, who significantly reinterpreted much of Freud's work. Lacan believed that there are three different orders or registers that describe different dimensions of the human experience. These three registers, the imaginary, the symbolic, and the real, explain how we form our own self-identity and how we interact with the world around us. The imaginary is the realm of images, fantasies, and self-identity, shaped by early experiences and identifications, most notably the mirror stage. The mirror stage often occurs during infancy, when the child is first able to recognize their reflection as themselves. Seeing and recognizing this reflection is when your self-identity begins to form, however, it's based on a misrecognition. It's kind of that same feeling that you get when you look at old pictures of yourself. Neither a reflection or a picture is actually capable of fully capturing who you are. The second register is the symbolic, and it is the realm of language and social structure. The symbolic shapes the way that we think, speak, and relate to other people. We use language to represent real things, but our unconscious associations shape our understanding. For example, if I were to say the word dog, we both know what kind of animal I'm talking about. But your past experiences shape the way you feel. If you've had numerous bad encounters with dogs, you probably don't like them very much. Those past experiences might invoke a negative connotation around the word. But I've never really had a super negative experience with a dog, so even though we're talking about the same thing, our associations with that thing are entirely different. The real is the final register, and it resists the other two. When I say that it resists the other two registers, what I mean by that is that it cannot be fully put into words or images. The real is experienced when the other two registers are challenged or fractured, most commonly through traumatic experiences. 
where something that is meaningful to us is taken away or torn apart. Imagine you're walking down the sidewalk with one of your friends, and out of nowhere, a car swerves off the road and hits them, and just like that, they're gone. This would be an encounter with the real. You would be standing there frozen in shock, unable to process what just happened. The other two orders were just ruptured, because there's no way you would ever be able to explain that experience in words or images. To Lacan, the uncanny is a glimpse past the symbolic and into the real. You're seeing something that isn't alive, but it almost seems like it might be. The boundaries between what is alive and what's not collapse, and the result is the uncanny. The real is pressing through, something that is outside our comprehension. So does the uncanny creep us out because of repressed childhood beliefs or a glimpse past the symbolic and imaginary orders? Maybe that's a part of it, I'm not the one to say. The uncanny is very hard to define and to put into words, but there have been several other theories proposed as to why we evolved to fear the almost human. The mate selection theory states that uncanny features may signal poor reproductive health or genetic defects. We evolved to be repulsed by the almost human because they could signal low fitness in potential mates. From an evolutionary standpoint, mate selection involves subconscious checks for reproductive fitness. Traits commonly associated with the uncanny, like lifeless eyes or pale skin, could indicate infertility or developmental issues. These traits unconsciously trigger this feeling of rejection to avoid passing on the weak genes. I'm kind of going to spoil my own beliefs on this. I think that the uncanny is a conglomerate of a bunch of different things. This is one of the only ones that I think I would count out entirely. Because first of all, I see people that I'm not attracted to all the time, and I would not classify them as uncanny or say that I'm repulsed by them. And besides that, I wouldn't be able to look at a male doll or figurine and feel that same uncanny sensation because I'm interested in women. So I don't think the uncanny valley has anything to do with mate selection or avoiding passing on weak genes. Another theory is disease avoidance. Strange and unnatural features might subconsciously remind us of symptoms of illness, triggering an avoidant reaction to reduce the risk of infection. Evolution of course favored humans who could detect early signs of illness in others and avoid them. Features like odd coloring and sluggish robotic movement are often found in figures that fall into the uncanny valley, but they can also be signs of illness. We may be seeing these features as signs of possible illness, invoking an avoidant reaction. The predator avoidance theory states that the uncanny valley may be a side effect of our predator detection systems. A being that looks almost human, but not quite, could set off primal alarm bells of spotting a predator wearing a human disguise. This would also explain why the robotic movement makes this feeling more pronounced, because the jerky unnaturalness of it resembles something pretending to be human. This is the other one that I'm not too sure about, because as far as I know, there's never been a predator that closely mimicked human behavior. Since the uncanny valley is a pretty universal feeling, it wouldn't make sense for it to be passed down to everyone if it wasn't benefiting our survival. Obviously, predator detection would be incredibly important to early human survival, but specifically fearing the almost human and human mimics seems a little bit out there. Unless our ancestors were regularly encountering skinwalkers and wendigo, it doesn't really make sense to me for this trait to be passed down to everybody. Because seeing a saber-toothed tiger standing in front of you and then seeing a mannequin that looks like it might be alive are two completely different feelings. The corpse recognition theory states that uncanny features often mirror traits found in corpses or mortally ill humans. Again with the waxy skin and glassy eyes, but also the rigid posture and slack facial expressions. These traits make us feel uncomfortable because of a subconscious association we have between them and death. This one is pretty similar to the disease avoidance theory, which is why I waited to cover this one as well. Both of these theories make sense to me, it's just part of your brain trying to keep you alive and part of staying alive is keeping you healthy and avoiding getting sick. Of course, staying around sick, dying, or dead people is probably suboptimal for your health and well-being as a human. So your brain subconsciously steers you away and says, maybe staying around this isn't the best idea. The other hominid hypothesis states that the uncanny valley is a leftover from when we coexisted with other human-like hominids, like Neanderthals and Denisovans. Our encounters with these species may have regularly involved competition for things like resources and food, leading to a hardwired caution response for almost human faces. 
Even though we're now the only remaining hominin species left, our brain may have retained this evolutionary suspicion towards anything that may resemble a separate tribe. Alright, I know I said I'm only counting a couple of these out, and I don't know if I want to count this one out completely, but to me, it definitely seems very unlikely. Maybe it's a part of it because I can see how we would be competing with other species of humans for food and resources. But personally, I would not breed with something or someone that I found to be uncanny looking. And we know that early Homo sapiens bred with Neanderthals. There are people in the world right now who have more Neanderthal DNA than you or I because their ancestors bred with Neanderthals. So again, I don't think this one holds a lot of weight. The category ambiguity theory states that we as people like to put things into categories, and we prefer to be able to tell definitively whether something is human or not. If you look at an object, you put it into the category of not being alive. But if that object is a doll or mannequin that looks somewhat like a real person, our brains try and fail to force a classification, creating that unsettling feeling. This one is pretty straightforward and it makes a lot of sense to me. It kind of ties back to Lacan's theory of the other orders being challenged. I used a dog earlier as an example, so I'm going to use that again. Could you imagine coming home one day and your dog is speaking to you fluently? Maybe after a while you get used to it, it might even be kind of cool for a little bit, but your immediate reaction, or at least my immediate reaction, would be that uncanny feeling, because part of what I know about dogs is that they don't speak. So if my dog started speaking to me, it's breaking my classification of what a dog is. Another theory is the violation of social norms. As humans, we have behavioral expectations for others baked into our DNA. You can think about something like eye contact. Generally, we all feel comfortable holding eye contact for short durations of time, usually between two to five seconds. But when you meet a person who is breaking eye contact too frequently or holding it for too long, it makes you feel uneasy. Our brain is subconsciously noticing that the behavior being exhibited feels like mimicry, and it flags the entity as being possibly deceptive or manipulative. Again, this one makes sense to me, and I can definitely see how this would be a part of it. I've definitely met people in my life who make eye contact for way too long or make it too intensely, so maybe the Uncanny Valley is just that, but the next step up. It's the same feeling, but just a more intense version. So in conclusion, we don't really know what the Uncanny is or why these things that fall into the Uncanny Valley valley disturb us so much. While we don't have a definitive reason for the uncanny valley's existence, it's likely the result of multiple systems overlapping rather than just having one specific cause. It reveals just how deeply we care about what it means to be human, and how violated we can feel when something blurs the line between that boundary. Thank you so much for watching, I really hope that you enjoyed this video and that you learned something new or at least found it entertaining. Also I need to say thank you guys for 20,000, 30,000, and now almost 40,000 subscribers. It is really crazy. That is really just mind blowing to me. My goal was 50,000 before the end of the year and it looks like we're gonna get there. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to like, comment, and share because it helps me out. And if you want to see more content like this, don't forget to subscribe because I will be making more videos in the future. Also, you guys may have noticed that Jack, my cat, did not make his usual cameo in this video. Uh, I unfortunately have to let you guys know that Jack was put to sleep on the 12th of this month. You guys are the only ones who really get to see him, so I figured I had to let you guys know. Jack was getting very sick. He went to the vet about a month or two ago and the only thing that they could think of it being was bowel cancer. Jack was my childhood pet. Um, he was almost 18 years old, and the only thing that could be done was to take him home and make sure he lives the rest of his life out in happiness and comfort. There were points where I was really hoping that the vet got it wrong and that he would be around for you know a few more years, but his quality of life was drastically decreasing, and it wasn't fair to keep him around and to keep him suffering or to put him through treatment uh, for, you know, hopes of him surviving. The last thing I want to do is, you know, see him suffer. So, sorry to end things on such a depressing note. Um, I didn't really want to talk about it, but I, I figured I should let you guys know, because like I said, you guys are the only ones who really get to see him, besides me. He was the sweetest cat you'll ever meet. Um, yeah, I miss him a lot. But anyways, again, sorry to end it off on such a depressing note. My name is Chase, this has been Scare Files, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again in the next video. Peace.